I uh, wanted to come up here just a moment before Hazen uh, shared just to punctuate what he's getting ready to talk to us about. If you've been around for the past three or four weeks, we've come out of a series of We Go Together. And one of the exciting announcements that we made is that we, along with the Holy Spirit, have a sense of readiness to, to plant a Gate City Church in the heart of the city of Atlanta. Amen. And so we have said that, we've come out, and the leaders leading the charge are Hazen and Hannah along with others. But I want to take a moment and just share with all of us that this wasn't just a good idea that we came up with, you know, six months ago in a room, but it's, it's very much a part of the larger, unique story that God has for our spiritual family. If you've been around for a few years, you know our church has an um, unusual evolutionary process that we've gone through. In the last six or seven years, the, the Lord supernaturally brought together three churches, a fundamental Baptist church, a Pentecostal AG church, and a house of prayer that the Lord wove together three unique stories that became one story, and then we renamed ourselves Gate City in 2021. It's amazing what the Lord has done. And so when we talk about going and planting a church, I just want to give you just a little piece of information from my own story, how I am getting to live in an environment with, with all of you folks. It's a fulfillment of things that were deep in my heart years and years ago, even back to the early 2000s when we planted our church. And um, I had some dreams in my heart at that time, and I didn't know how to actualize these dreams. Who's ever heard of the Knights of the Round Table? Remember the imagery? Who's ever seen the old movie First Night with a Sean Connery and Richard Gere? Lance, have you ever seen it? All right, great. They, at least you got a little bit of uh, context. I remember watching that movie years ago, and, and there's a scene when King Arthur he gets off of the throne, and he sits down at the round table with his brothers. And they all lay their sword together as one. And I remember thinking then, said, Lord, this is what I want to be part of. But unfortunately, we existed in a church structure that had a hierarchy where you had the senior pastor and everything happened under, under that. And it's just, it, I never could like that. I never liked what that looked like. And I longed to be with a group of Men in fellowship, moving the ball forward, realizing how fallible I am and how much we need each other. Always attempting that. And I think if you follow the news at all, you are very aware that a lot of ministries don't make it because there's such isolation and lack of accountability. Mm. But that was, that was a dream inside of my heart that we would try to achieve over the years. And I can tell you with confidence, just in the last three or four years, the Lord has answered that dream. He has put a mutuality and leadership and brotherhood that I could have only dreamed about 15 or 20 years ago. That God has put that in that place where we're able to steward the prophetic destinies that God has for us. Also, going back in time, I remember the Lord um, asking me a question. It was kind of an odd question. He said, as we were getting ready to build our church, he says, do you want a um, hen house or do you want an eagle's nest? And I knew what he meant when he said, Hen house. Do you want a church that will, that will be driven by just people piling consumerism and everybody getting what they want and cool and hit factors, whatever? And, and I said, no, Lord, I, I don't want that. He said, well, do you want an eagle's nest? They're both kind of birds, but they're very different in their application. Do you want an eagle's nest where there would be camaraderie, there would be, there'd be a sense of purpose, appetite would be greater, flying at higher altitudes, being sent forth and not holding on to. I remember asking God, I said, yes, Lord, I want to be a part of that environment where we raise up and send out eagles. Fast forward to 2017, we had a moment here on the platform, and, and there was a, uh, back then we were known as Newbridge Church before the house of prayer was rolled into it, and we had a um, prophetic man come through, and, and he gave us all a word, our church family. He said, I can give you one of two things, is what God said. He said, I can make you a great church on the corner. Thank God for great churches on the corner. Amen. I can make you a great church on the corner if that's what you seek. Or I can, I can give you something else. I can give you a church that's going to be anchored in intercessory prayer, that will be a 
that will be a beachhead for revival in our region. And I remember we heard that at the time, and, and I wasn't exactly sure what option two was, but I knew I didn't want option one. I knew the Lord had something else. So we said, yes, Lord, we want to be a spiritual family that's anchored in intercessory prayer. I have no idea how to do that, God, but that's what we want. And we want to be, and we want to see revival come to our entire region. We said yes to that. Well, as um, the Lord would direct, we found ourselves doing a wedding in Savannah, Georgia, me and Billy and Hazen, uh, for a young man who was part of our church and a young lady who was part of the house of prayer. And we found ourselves together doing a wedding ceremony. Um, Having no idea God was giving us a little, a little prophetic sign of all was to come. We would come back from Savannah. A few weeks later, I would have a dream. And, and in this dream, I am in a room with Pastor Jeff from the Baptist Church and Billy Humphrey from the Atlanta House of Prayer. And we're sitting around just talking about all the great things that we have in common. And, and in the dream, a loom appears a weaver's loom, and on one side was Newbridge, and the other side was Atlanta House of Prayer, I have Atlanta, and they were getting closer and closer and closer together. And there was a moment we began to look at the loom, and we looked down, and we knew the hand of God was pulling the yarn, and God pulled one time, and he brought the two together. And I woke up from that dream, not with a shout of hallelujah, but oh, no, I said, you can this is way beyond what we could have imagined. I was so overcome and just in the presence of God, I, I, I stood next to my bathroom sink at 2 a.m. in the morning, shaking and quivering, nauseous. God, what have, what have you just said? What have you just said? And I remember the Lord speaking to my heart saying, son, I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just announcing what I'm doing. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just announcing what, what I'm doing. All I need is your yes and your obedience. So we just had a few conversations. And to make a long story short, now we sit here today in this miraculous thing that the Lord has done. And one of the unique things he has called us to do in our prophetic assignment that's anchored in the word of God in fulfilling the great commission is to go forth and share the gospel. And our unique assignment is to plant a church in the city of Atlanta, which will be the second one, ultimately five, that will cover our city in a canopy of worship and prayer Amen. to see revival come. That's what we're believing for. That's Amen. the beachhead for revival. That's the sending out eagles, and it's done from a place of camaraderie and deep mutuality, friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood with each other. Amen? So Amen. that's what we're about. Hazen is going to share with you some really helpful things. So, brother, let me pray for you real quick, and we'll me, get out, let you turn you loose. Father, thank you for my brother. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, even as I tell this story, I just am in amazement at your perfect leadership. Jesus, we want to represent you well. We want to be full of integrity, character, virtue, anchored in your word, listening to your prophetic unction in our ears, Lord, accountable to you and to each other. That's who we are. That's what we, what we desire to be, Lord, not just aspirational, but walking it out in the grace of God, in the name of Jesus. So bless my brother as he shares today, Lord, and let us all be caught up, Lord, in what you are doing, and most of all, Lord, in knowing you and understanding what you really want, God, is a bride, a people, Lord, who love you and are following you, and going, going deep in the knowledge of God. That's our desire. Bless my friend. Bless my brother. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Dustin. I'm really touched, you know, I was, before we get into the meat of the message, I'm just really touched with you sharing the stories that you just shared, and your desire to bless Hannah and I as we endeavor to go forward with some of what's next for our Gate City spiritual family. And the thing I, I sense the Holy Spirit staying, even as we were standing up here, even though you're not old enough to be my father, I'll just go ahead and say that outright. Okay, Dustin's not, he's not quite that old, right? My dad wasn't a believer. I didn't grow up with a dad who read the Bible to me or prayed for me or any of those things. And if that's your experience, you know, a lot of times, even though I had a good relationship with my dad, I never got to experience the spiritual blessing of a father. And maybe some of you can relate to that. But I just sensed even in this moment the goodness of God that he says that if you will, for my name's sake, give up lands, family, 
parents, you know, with a variety of different things that sometimes we're called upon to separate ourselves up from, from the sake of the gospel. And we became, when I became a Christian and began to follow Jesus, my dad did not understand and there was a separation that happened in our relationship. He says, I'll give you a hundred times more in this life and in the age to come. And the mentorship of Dustin and Billy and other men like that who have been leaders and gone before me. And now it just strikes me that both in public and in private, I can receive your blessing on my life and the life of my family. And I just want to thank you for that place in uh, my life and the life of our spiritual family. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Michelle, for being mothers and fathers in this house. And it's just an incredible gift. And I've said that to him privately, but it was just touching my heart and I wanted to say it publicly. And and the same to Billy, who uh, he's out of town today but his heart is a heart of blessing that goes uh, above and beyond public blessing. Some people will, will bless you. I haven't experienced this in my ministry, but others have, where they bless you publicly, but they undermine you privately. Okay? And I'm just thankful that we have leaders that are blessing you, us in public and supporting us in private. All right. <laughs> All right. I can't help but just... Um, so, amen, amen. good, so th- thank you for that, Dustin and Michelle. So today, we're going to share an interesting message and an interesting moment, and oh, I'm going to do my best with the 37 minutes I have. So last week, I opened up on this message for the city, talking about stewarding prophetic destiny, and kind of laid out some cultural principles for us on how we steward the prophetic. We want to be a spiritual family that does not shy away from the gifts of God and the gifts of the Spirit, and the Bible is very clear that there's a preeminence of love and there's a priority within the gifts. If you read 1 Corinthians 14, it actually says very plainly, it says, desire the spiritual gifts and especially that you may prophesy, but never to the neglect of the higher priority of love, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving one another. And so when we have a community of love and fellowship, loving each other, loving the lost, loving our city, and then the gifts of the Spirit are meant to amplify godly character, the ministry of the spirit and there's a specific gift called the gift of prophecy that is meant to edify and strengthen the body. And so we uh, do not substitute the prophetic for biblical principles or truth. And I'm going to kind of name some ways in which we erect guardrails so that the prophetic can happen in in the healthiest way. And I'm going to share even prophetic stories that I think are dynamic, significant. They're important to me. They're important to our spiritual family. I'm going to put those in the last kind of 20% of this message. Share some of what I feel like is the bigger story so that we can all kind of find our place in that larger story. But in light of even recent failures within some ministries in our movement and in our nation around this specific point where prophetic narratives were told, but now because of character issues and issues within those ministries, there's a question of whether those prophetic narratives were ever true, right? And in some ways, that's the elephant in the room. And I couldn't have anticipated that I would be giving bold prophetic declarations at the same time where prophetic narratives within our movement are being called into question. That's the moment we're in. But it actually provides an incredible opportunity where we see the importance. We all feel, for those of you who are aware of what I'm referring to, I'm making an oblique reference, but those who are aware of what I'm referring to, we feel the need for the very thing that I'm talking about today in a way that is, is unique, that only God, can, only God could allow for kind of by his spirit this confluence of circumstances so that we can talk about how we're gonna strengthen what is necessary to create a healthy prophetic culture, right? And I mentioned this in the last service and I felt like there were, man, it was like, I, I hit so many good points that weren't in my notes and I was like, I don't even know if I can reproduce those. So if you wanna hear like a different version of this message, go back and listen to the first service because it was, it was good. I was like, that was good. Somebody write that down. I didn't even have that in my notes. But one of the things I mentioned that I thought was very helpful is just this idea that like a lot of times like you'll have prophetic ministry that is an important part of significant ministries. It's misappropriated or misused in ways to manipulate people or in order for people to enrich themselves. And then we go, okay, because that was mistreated, we kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and we say, because prophetic ministry was part of this ministry and there was a bad character or misapplication, therefore prophetic ministry is bad. But we would never do that with Bible teaching, right? Though there is many equally bad examples of people that taught the Bible, did it in a way to enrich themselves, we see the fruit of that, and then we go, well, that's wrong, but we would never throw away teaching the Bible. 
or because in our city there was a prominent failure among the largest apologetics ministry in the world, the most prominent, the most well-regarded. There were significant moral failures, right? And that's publicly known. I'm not going to go into that, but I go, we would never point to that and go, because the most notable apologist in the world morally failed, therefore apologetics must be bad, therefore we should throw that out as a ministry, right? The wise thing to do is to look at the circumstance in which there's failure around something that is biblical and go, how can we learn from the mistakes that were made? And how can we do better? And how can we be honest and do it in a healthy way? And so this today, in part, is my attempt to give you my best thoughts on how we are actualizing some things in our culture that are healthy, that allow us to minister in the prophetic in an appropriate way, while at the same time telling the actual prophetic things that I think we have to enter into as a community. And so my hope is that we are both discipling our body in these thoughts and principles that are bigger than the prophetic ministry, but that it creates a healthy context in which we can engage in this ministry that is an important ministry within the Bible. And I want the standard of my life to be the ministry of Jesus, amen? And then those that were discipled by Jesus. And when I look at their ministry, I see that they rooted it in scripture, they rooted it in community, and they also operated in the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that that is part of a life, and that is part of a life that is actualizing the things of God and bringing the kingdom to bear. And so, but the danger is because of abuse of a specific area, we sometimes can go, you know what, something that's biblical, we see it mistreated, and now we're afraid of that thing. Or we're afraid of how it would express itself uh, within the worst of human tendencies. Right, And so I'm going to try and give us some thoughts that will give us courage to, okay, when these things are in place, there is an opportunity for the healthy expression of the prophetic ministry. And when we have a healthy expression of the prophetic ministry, it is a dynamic catalyst to the kingdom of God. That is why Paul calls it a uniquely desirous gift. Because where the gift of the prophetic ministry is in place, the body is encouraged, edified, and comforted by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good. So, my wife says I do long introductions. I'm going to try and keep this one short. Review from last week. So, last week we talked about three principles, and I hope that you guys have thought about these. You can scan the notes also if you want to kind of follow along. I believe it does. When you follow along, it does add clarity to what I'm sharing sometimes to read those things uh, alongside. And so, this is the review. I'm going to hit it very quickly and not go into the Bible verses, but there are Bible verses within these points. The three principles for last week, and the intent of these principles is for us to understand that there's a larger story, principle one, that is God's prophetic story. It's over individuals, families, nations, and God is the greatest storyteller. I mean, you look at the Bible, it's an amazing story, and it's woven together over families and generations and nations, and it tells this amazing story, and God has never stopped to be a storyteller. He's still telling amazing stories, and we get to find ourselves in the story of God over families, over regions, church bodies, nations. There is a larger story, and we can touch that story through the word of God, through our intimacy with God, and through the prophetic ministry. Amen. There's also smaller stories where we have to fulfill our part, and we have to understand our part, and the, and faithfully doing our part in the larger story I talked about last week has to do with our life formation and faithfully walking out our spiritual formation, okay? And a lot of times there can be this negative tendency because the larger story can make us feel significant, we get lost in the larger story and we neglect the faithfulness in the smaller story that allows us to actually play our part in a healthy way. I gave an example, impromptu example earlier, but it really was true. The largest ministry thing I'd ever done to date was this march on Atlanta that we'll show some pictures of, and I'll tell a significant prophetic word that the Lord told me. It was on June 19th of 2020. And it happened to be that in about two and a half weeks, we planned this event that was very significant and catalytic for our city. Tens of thousands were involved in it. It was one of the most amazingly grace-filled and difficult things I've ever done in my entire life. I literally took myself out to a steak dinner after I finished it because I was so pleased. 
me and the other guy, Gene, who has like played this critical role, he and I went, they were packing everything up, closing on the stage, and Gene and I went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse right there by, and we, we had a steak, and we were just very self-satisfied that we, <laughs> we were like, we did it. We ate a big steak, praise God. And so... We've been like Daniel fasting for three weeks. Um, <laughs> so, but it happened to be that on the very same day that I did one of the largest things in ministry, my mom, which was a big prayer request, had been moving from North Carolina to Georgia, and we'd begun the process of buying her house next door to us. It was also one of the most significant life circumstance situations. And guess the day that they scheduled the closing of her new house, four weeks before, never knowing that we were going to do this event in the heart of Atlanta, the exact same day. Right? And what the Lord was speaking to me through this situation was he goes, you know, I've got my eye on you, little buddy. I'm taking care of your life circumstances, and there are ways you have to be faithful in the care for your mother, okay? And there are ways that you have to be faithful in the care for your ministry. And I actually care equally about both. And he was actually speaking to me about both. And I had to hold both in tension. You know, the Bible says if you don't care for your own family, you're worse than an unbeliever, right? And so part of the authority... Part of, the, part of what allows for the authority to stand on a platform and minister, or to minister to a person in an altar, minister to your coworker at work, whatever your sphere of influence is, is that there's actual integrity between the ministry and the way that you live your life privately. And can I tell you, I'm saying that with a tremble in me because I know my life, the integrity of my message and my aspiration to have integrity in that, and the way I perform, sometimes I fall short. I'm probably the only one in the room, right, that falls short. I'm not supposed to because I'm up here speaking, right? But let's just be real. That's the reality for all of us that are ascribing to have Jesus as our example. And I'm going, Lord, conform me to, my, to, conform me to your image as I'm being discipled. But I go, that's the reality. I go, I want to have a formed life spiritually. I want to have a formed life in the practicals. And then from that place, I want to lay the entirety of my life down at your feet to do the greater things of the kingdom of God. And I don't want to live in a church reality that only talks about the greater things, but they're just delusions of grandeur because you can't get up and faithfully read your Bible in the morning. So you're not going to preach to multitudes, beloved. And I don't want to live a life where the entirety of my Christianity is all about just getting up and doing my Bible time faithfully. And that's the sole purpose of my Christianity is to live in a hen house and just feed myself. Right? Right? And you know what pillages hen houses, right? Foxes, right? I mean, when you are not living for a greater story than yourself, you'll get bored in your Christianity. You'll give way to religiosity because the sum total of your Christianity is about self-gratification, right? And then you'll just find other ways to gratify yourself and you'll let foxes into the hen house, okay? And so we have to live for a bigger vision. We have to live on mission as eagles, right, and not hens, okay? Dustin was trying to be kind to the hens in the first service. I said, you just need to say hens are bad. He was like, they're both birds. It's okay to be a hen. I was like, nobody wants to be a hen, Dustin. <laughs> he was trying to be kind to him. And I said, just say it plainly, you know. And there's hens in every, I'm just, I'm saying there's hens in every congregation, right? If you're one today and you're hearing what I'm saying, repent of being a chicken. <laughs> right? Like seriously, repent of that attitude that says my Christianity is about me when it really should be about Jesus and his purpose for your life. And so, and I'm like, I'll answer that also, Carl, because there are ways that I'll get focused on myself, my needs, what I need, my house, my family, my kids, my kids' education, my money, make sure my money's right, make sure this is right. And you just get in the spiral of that anxiety, and that's, that can become the substance of your entire life, right? And so it takes faith to break out of the monotony of that and to actually say, I'm going to reach for something greater than myself, but at the same time, I have to make sure that those things are attended to in faithfulness according to the way in which the Bible tells me to live. So that's what we're talking about is those two things together. And guess what? Somebody who lives that way is very dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. We see the revival in Ephesus. We see that Paul lived this way. And I never had quite captured it this way, but I think he's a premier example. Acts 19 and Acts 20. It says in Acts 19, Paul is... Uh, Luke is describing Paul's ministry in Ephesus, a place in which it says the whole of Asia Minor, the whole region, heard the word of God and it prevailed because of the two-year ministry that Paul had in that region. It's a powerful apostolic witness, one of those powerful revivals in history. 
in the, in the history of the scriptures and possibly in the entirety of history. And it says in Acts 19.11, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. Who's ever read that in the Bible and gone, I want to do that, God? Come on, right? Like, that's probably why you're at Gate City, is you want to be in a church body that believes for those kinds of things, because it's in the Bible. Amen. Amen. And then Acts 20, 34, Paul's describing to the Ephesian elders, reminding him of the manner of life that he lived when he was with them during those two years. This is their final departing, because he's going to go to Jerusalem and then eventually Rome, and this is the last time he may ever see them face to face. And he says, you yourselves know, these hands have provided for my necessities, and for those who are with me. And I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of our Lord that he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The same hands that did miracles labored to provide for himself. Okay. A lot of times in ministry context, it's like these are the miracle working hands. Nobody touched these miracle working hands. And those miracle working hands are going to be provided for by the Miracles they produce, right? So pay me for my stature in ministry. And that is a conventional thing in our Western ministry. And I'm not hitting it at any one particular person in saying that. We know that that is something that's true. The man or the woman of God, because of their status and because of their gifting, are meant to be provided because of that spiritual gifting. But Paul says, these same hands that work miracles, right, they also labored as a tent maker day in and day out. So that you can know it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And while many of us may pray, God, use my hands to perform miracles, we also need to pray, God, use my hands to labor so I can support the weak with my giving and generosity. Empower me to work hard so I can work hard every day at a, at a laborious job so that I can give that money away. Lord, please allow me to live this way. Would you but grant me the grace? Yeah, we aren't praying that prayer typically, right? But what made Paul unique and special is that he was both in the highest heavens, in his heart and in his mind, with his feet firmly planted in the dirt. And that's a person that can be a bridge between heaven and earth. Someone who knows God can move through my hands as I do miracles, as I labor faithfully. I can put my hand on my coworker this week and see God do a miracle. And part of God's purpose for my life is that I would be in that job and faithful as a Christian so when they do a miracle, they've got a living testimony of the Christian life right before them of someone that works hard, isn't lazy, shows up on time. So that our character demonstrates the veracity of the miracle and the nature of the God who is holy that did that miracle in that person's life. And that's it. That's what I want to do, guys. I want to build a spiritual family that both lives with a big vision, breakthrough God, breakthrough of God in revival and transformation in our city, power coming down from on high, just like the men and women of old, just like the Bible. And I want to be so faithful and integrous in my walk with Jesus. And a lot of times it's like because of that integrity, people dismiss the, because of the lack of integrity, people dismiss the greater things of God. And my question is, are the greater things of God in the Bible? Are the greater things of God in Jesus' life? Are the greater things of God in the pantheon of those who would be in the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 12? Because if those greater things of God are present in the Bible, it doesn't matter what the failures are of individuals, we should still be reaching for the greater things of God. While not failing to walk in integrity and righteousness and faithfulness in the formation of our life and the formation of our practices. Amen. Amen. Good. So my wife was right. That was a very long introduction. But it was good, right? It was good. Okay. So now I'm going to hit what I think. So go, if that's, you go, I'm bought into that and that's why I'm here. Right, I go, okay, what's the guardrails that exist within community and within our individual lives to help the prophetic be his, uh, healthy? And I'm going to give them to us quickly so I have time to share the prophetic stories that I want to share. If you want a little bit more expounded version of these, I refer you to the first service. So point one, right? Well, I've got to read this one other part. 
the healthy characteristics of a community stirring the prophetic. So we have to be led by biblical conviction and the Holy Spirit, not prophetic gifts. I am led in my life by convictions that I have from the Bible and my fellowship with the Holy Spirit around the Bible, not by prophetic ministry. Now what prophetic ministry can give us is courage, specific direction, and at times needed clarity and strategy. If you will, prophetic ministry is the sauce, not the steak. Okay? I bought some really good barbecue last night. The sauce was almost as good as the barbecue. It was, it was good. It was awesome. But I've never gone anywhere and ordered sauce. Have you? We want the substance and the sauce. I don't mean to diminish. It's a, it's a, it's a poor metaphor. I don't mean to dim, dim, diminish, the, diminish the gift of prophecy to just being sauce. But the main thing that I want you to hear is that there's a substance of biblical clarity and conviction that is in the Christian's life. And what the, what the prophetic ministry should do is amplify the substance of our lives. And so we see this in the life of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles. Prophecy will never be a substitute for an intimate daily walk, leading a responsible formed life, or biblical imperatives. When it becomes more important than those things, we will have an unhealthy prophetic culture. If prophetic experience gets elevated over the word of God, it will begin to become unhealthy. If we see uh, lifestyles that are not formed where okay, I go to get prophetic ministry instead of going to hear from God in the secret place, right? It will become unhealthy. If I am convinced that the latest prophetic thing that I have is the main thing I need to give my life to, to the neglect of other biblical imperatives, you'll get out of balance and you'll end up moving from one thing to the next based on what is prophetic rather than living a foundational life that values multiple things that are expressed in the word of God, right? And so the Bible gives us our lifestyle, our teaching, our understanding, our doctrine. Prophecy can give us points of emphasis and strategy and clarity, but that is never to be substituted for biblical imperative and a life lived in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I said it this way, appropriate stewardship of prophetic destiny. Okay, the big prophetic destiny, wow, right? We all want to live out prophetic destiny, but it has to be done in the mundane of the fundamental commitments of the Christian life. I really, I, I really want to walk out my prophetic destiny. So I really need to be in the word of God daily. I really want to walk out my prophetic destiny, so I really need to be discipling my children because God won't give me charge over his house if I don't faithfully steward my household. That's what the word of God says, right? How many people do we see, honestly, their failure comes because they have a strong public gift and they neglected their private responsibilities, either to family or devotion? And I go, I don't want to live that way. How do we prevent it? Okay, let's talk about it. First, a lifestyle of continuous prayerful conversation. This is point one, okay? As I'm receiving prophetic ministry, everything that I'm hearing from God, I'm holding in prayer with him. I'm journaling it. I'm talking to him about it. I'm studying the word about it, if it is important. If he, we're having a conversation, the conversation of, of prayer and the conversation of the prophetic needs to be rooted in uh, needs to be rooted in daily communion with God that produces fruitfulness, not periodic experiences of the phenomenon of the prophetic. I've had some phenomenal experiences. I've had encounters with angels, guys, real encounters with angels. I rarely talk about them because I haven't had a lot of reason to talk about them. Had real encounters with angels, but I, as phenomenal as those are, I can't live on my experiences that I've had with angels. Right. That would be weird, <laughs> Right? Now, those were experiential, experiential times of learning that emphasize something is very important. If you've ever had an angel visit you and communicate something to you, that's probably something you should pay attention to. Amen. But not without taking it back, measuring it to the word, and how do we pay attention to it? The thing the angel says, you pray about it. And you hold it within your relationships of discernment. And you ask, was this an angel or was this a demon? Because I've had angels come and communicate things to me, and everybody wants to hear about those stories. Not today. (laughs) 
But there's also times where I've had to test something that I thought I heard, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit, guys, and it wasn't an angelic being. It was a demonic being trying to sow deception into my life. And anytime you open yourself up to the gifts of the Spirit, guess what? You're not only opening yourself up to the the good, positive, and affirming voices and our ability to discern those things which are spiritual from the demonic to the Holy Spirit or my flesh or my soul causes us to follow things that may not be Jesus. So how do we tell? Constant conversation, point two, long-term commitment to healthy community life. If you want to be involved in community life, we have many opportunities for us here as a spiritual family. Let me fix this for you guys. All right, there you go. So Wellspring, our journey into wholehearted living, our discipleship school, worship teams in the prayer room, our house church environments, all those smaller environments where you get life on life, accountability and clarity, those are the places, I'm going to speed up a little bit here, where we get to live with open and vulnerable hearts, true accountability in our relationships, and we get to submit things to one another Hopefully, we have people around us that are walking in discernment. And the thing I'll hit on today is, uh, in terms of accountability and discernment, what, what that means to be in true community is, do you have people in your life that can tell you no? No, that wasn't God. No, that's the wrong decision. Or no, that's sinful, you need to stop that. Right? And if you have a relationship in which you think you're walking in accountability, but they've never told you no, and you've had to feel the burn of having somebody tell you no, I doubt you're truly walking in accountability because you're not that perfect to never had to have somebody tell you no. And when they tell you no, you know your real accountability when you submit to that no. Rather than saying, oh, I didn't like the way they said that to me. I didn't like the spirit in which they corrected me. Guess what? Nobody likes to hear somebody tell them no when you want to do something. And part of what will keep you safe as a Christian is have that hard relationship with somebody that will look you dead in the eye and say, do not do that. That is not God. You need to slow down or you need to stop it. And say it to you in love as harsh as you need to hear it to stop. And just being real, I've had people look at me, I go, that's, you don't need to do, you need to stop that. Or the way you did that was wrong, you need to repent, right? And that's a normal part of my Christianity. It should be a normal part of yours. And if you haven't formed those kinds of trusting relationships where somebody can tell you no, ask God to help you. But find that, and especially if you're in leadership, you need that. Okay, let's keep moving. Dedication to the word as the guide for the Christian life. I know that sounds permission to play, but it's just too true that when you get into charismatic spaces, right, oftentimes you'll hear the prophetic word, the dream, the vision, and it is entirely disconnected from the realities of Scripture. And what we want to do is we want to find a place where we stand upon the word of God because the word of God is the rock of our lives, right? But we are willing to be swirled by the winds of the Spirit while we stand upon the rock of God, His Word. And, I, and when I'm standing on the rock, I can safely say, God, send the winds, <laughs> right? Like when I'm rooted in the rock, when I'm rooted in the rivers of God, and that's where my root system is, okay, we won't get blown away by whatever winds God sends. And the Spirit of prophecy can send some pretty phenomenal winds, Right? But we want, to, we want those winds to come with us rooted in the rock. Second Timothy, Paul's instructing his disciple Timothy, says it this way. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the reality is if you're not rooted in the scripture, you may not be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lastly, put these two together, we want to focus on serving others with spiritual gifts, and we want to focus on humility. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, if you're zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And just being honest in my own journey, oftentimes with the prophetic, or with ministry, or with healing, or with miracles, 
The truth is, though you want it for someone else, you want them to experience their miracle, I want to experience that miracle as much for myself as I do for them. And that mixture is in there for all of us. Because guess what? I felt the pride swell up in my heart when God does something miraculous. And I just got, yeah, that's right. They got healed. (laughs) Or yeah, that's right. The word of knowledge was spot on. And it's so easy to begin to live for the praise of people, to begin to live for the endorsement of the supernatural, and to begin to care more about that than the impact that your ministry has upon the body. And then what happens is your ego increases with every miracle, with every accurate prophetic word, with every message preached that people applaud. And what that produces in us is the desire to never have somebody give you a thumbs down. To never, have some, never walk away from somebody sick because how would, that make, how would that affect my reputation, affect me? And this subtle emphasis on self slips in with the spiritual gifts and really with any of the activity of the spirit that makes what I am doing and how God is using mostly about me rather than the person that is receiving from Jesus through me. Do you know what happens when that subtle impurity, that subtle yeast gets into our hearts regarding the prophetic ministry, the more God blesses, the more my sinful thought that it's about me grows. And eventually there'll be a point at which those two things, you you cannot serve God and self. You cannot serve God and mammon, right? And so I go, okay, I want to go ahead and put that to death by acknowledging it, by being honest about it, by being brutal, by being going, oh, Oh, man, when I prayed for that person and God did that miracle, I would, pride left up in my heart. Or when that person said that thing, Lord, please forgive me. For I, I want to be willing to, in humility, acknowledge the gifts of God that are flowing through my life and at the same time never attribute them to my own goodness. I acknowledge them. Thank you, God, for using me in that way. I'll acknowledge it, but I'll also recognize that is only because of God's mercy. Amen. So we focus on others and we focus on humility and our spiritual gifts. Amen. So when we create a culture that is the way that I just described, in which you have continuous conversation in prayer, you have community with real vulnerability and accountability, which is hard because those two things can be intention. But real, we're vulnerable and accountable. And then you create a context in which the word of God is held over our experiences as a measuring line for the reality of those things. And then you have humility and service to others. You're going to have a healthy prophetic culture. Okay? And if we create a container in which there is a healthy prophetic culture, that is going to be catalytic not just for the body here, but you will have an edified and strengthened body across the city. And one of the things I love about our prophetic culture is the majority of the prophetic things that happen in our community, they do not happen from the largest public platforms. They happen with people faithfully praying for somebody in the altar. They happen in little prayer meetings early in the morning where a prophetic singer opens the word and sings the word of God over the city of Atlanta. They happen in our prophecy rooms where three or four will minister to one individual and just open the word of God and pray and prophesy over them. Right? And so we have, so much of this is not aspirational, but if, you're, if we haven't ever named the good qualities of our, in our community related to these things, you wouldn't necessarily know that Dustin and I have real accountability. We sit between the service, and I go, did everything I say, did it sound biblically accurate? Is there any feedback? Did the stories I share sound truthful? Give me your thoughts, you know? And we have, a conver- we have a conversation dialogue. And that happens week after week where there's accountability around the word of God and what is said from this platform at the highest levels of our spiritual family. Amen. Amen. I almost feel like that's something worth applauding. Thank you, Jesus, for that, right? <laughs> but if you're not in those back rooms or you didn't know, you have to trust me that that's really happening. But I'm telling you, these things that I'm saying to you today, any health you see there because many of these things are already in place. But I'm naming them so we can continue to be accountable to live a culture like this. And I said it boldly in the last service, Dustin, Billy, myself, Ash, Rolando, Hannah, whoever our senior leaders are, if you ever see us not being faithful to these values, right, I challenge you, bring that to us, right, and hold us accountable to what we're saying in our public platform. Because we want to be rooted in the word. 
We want to be truly in accountability and vulnerability. We really want to be, uh, we really want to value the prophetic, but not value the prophetic over the word of God. We want to live formed lives. We want to do the things that I'm talking about so God can put maximum blessing on our lives individually. And by blessing, I don't mean wealth, health, money, and everything else. What I mean, the maximum blessing is that we would truly have the presence of God in our midst nourishing us as a spiritual family. That we would grow up into the fullness of the headship of Christ because we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers all functioning together in their gifts and the body of Christ doing the ministry that we'd be edified into the fullness of the head, which is Christ. Amen? We got 10 minutes. Y'all ready for some prophetic stories? Are y'all with me? Do you know why it's so important? I know it feels like, okay, you said a lot of things that we should already know. But it's so important to say what we need to say and then for us to all challenge each other. Are we doing these things? Are we doing these things? And in moments of reflection like we're in right now, I'm, I'm saying these things and I'm challenging myself. Am I doing these things so that we can grow? as a spiritual family, into all the destiny that God has for us. Amen. I want to go ahead. The worship team can actually go ahead and come up if they're in the back room or where they are. Okay. Yeah, I hope they're listening or someone could go grab them just so they're up and in place so we can have a little bit of time for ministry. So two stories that I want to share. One was June 26, 2021. I called these both build me, build me a church words because that was the phrase that the Lord used to describe what he was calling me to do in both these situations. And I'm going to try and kind of tell these stories quickly. But if you would like, a, again, a little bit longer version, I did it in the first service. But in this first story, it was two summers ago, and my family and I had gone as missionaries to Africa. We'd spent six weeks there. And part of this was us laying a fleece before the Lord. Were you calling us to be international missionaries? And we went on a ministry trip to a city called Moyale, which is on the border between Kenya and Ethiopia. And as we were there in Moyale, we did a prayer meeting in this uh, police barracks that had been abandoned, but it's at the physical high point of this city that is actually half Ethiopia and half Kenya, okay? And as we're there in Moyale on top of this hill doing this prayer meeting, it's overlooking a part of the city where a people group called the Gare live. And the Gare people, there's about 62,000 people. They're a subgroup of the Somali people. And they have no Bible translated in their heart language. There are known, no known churches among the Gare people. You can look them up on the Joshua Project. They're over 98% Muslim and less than 0.26% Christian. There are some Gari believers, but they're scattered. They don't meet together in community. They're overwhelmingly Muslim. They have no church. There's no Christian witness. There's no Bible in the heart language. And as my heart was breaking, as we're overlooking this community where these individuals live that no, have no opportunity to hear what any American could hear at any church that they walk into out of the thousands of churches, right, that are on every street corner or every website that gives that information in a language and culturally by the way. I mean, we have so much opportunity and there are tribes and peoples where there's no opportunity and there's even very little. We're pressing into God for the hope of an opportunity for those individuals to be reached with the gospel. Can you feel the weight of that? I mean, people that have lived among that tribe, their parents didn't know the gospel, their grandparents didn't know the gospel, and their children will not know the gospel, nor their grandchildren know the gospel unless someone goes. And I'm sitting there going, truly Isaiah 6 moment, going, I'm in this prayer meeting weeping and going, Lord, send me, I'll go. I'm probably not the most qualified, but I've never been qualified for anything (laughs) you would want me to do. Just, I'll go. As sincerely as I was giving the Lord my yes to that, and I remember opening to Romans 12 and the Holy Spirit speaking to me about different joints and parts of the body supplying, and he said, there are people that are better equipped to reach them than you. And I knew he was talking about there's, there's people with less cultural barriers that wouldn't have to learn the language. They wouldn't. But what he did say to me was he said, but I want you to go back to the United States and build me a church that will not forget these people. And I knew in that moment, I was, I was asking God to commission me one direction, and he was sending me, in his wisdom, the right direction, right? 
And so as we're building Gate City, we're going to go from our neighborhoods to the nations of the earth, and we're especially not going to forget the unreached. We're going to give money to it. We're going to send missionaries to it. We're going to support Bible translation. We're going to talk about it. And people are going to be like, you can't grow a church talking about the Gare people and unreached people. And I'm going to say, watch God build his church because God is committing a people who will say yes to the things that are his priorities on his prophetic priority list. And the Gare people are on his list that there would not be another generation that has no opportunity to hear. And he's raising up leaders that will say yes to that, and he's gonna resource and bless those leaders, I'm 100% sure, and they're gonna build churches that do what I'm describing, right? That are not hen houses, they're eagles' nests. And those eagles are gonna fly high, and they're gonna go wherever the Lord sends them in the world, right? But that's not my assignment, that's our assignment. To give and to go and to pray and to show up on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. and pray for the unreached of the nations of the earth. To do a missions training school, to give the most generous gifts we can give at the end of the year when we take up our missions offering. Thank you for giving the biggest gift that we've ever given as a spiritual family to reach the nations this year. It shows me the growing commitment of our community, the very thing I'm talking about. We are doing this, beloved. But I go, that was the build me a church word. We're, not, we're gonna build a church and we're gonna plant a church in the city of Atlanta We're going to plant locations across this city that amplify our ability to reach the unreached as a priority of our spiritual family. The second time the Lord spoke to me, and I want to show a picture of this one. If you could pull the picture up of Centennial Olympic Park. So this was in June 19th of 2020. I already referred to it earlier in the message. This is kind of the biggest in terms of ministry scope thing that we ever did. Had to plan it in two and a half weeks in the wake of the George Floyd circumstances We went right there to Centennial Olympic Park, which is where there was the most civil unrest during that time, right in front of the CNN Center. We started doing pop-up prayer meetings, and then the Lord had been already speaking to us about doing an event in Centennial Park. The Lord said, now's the time. Guys, we didn't have the money. We didn't have the people. We didn't have the expertise. We had a vision from God, and we had that, that sense that the vision from God was confirmed and wasn't just delusion of grandeur. But I couldn't have told you that until it was reality fully. I mean, I had to hold it in humility before the Lord. And I could just talk of the miracles that God did to get us to this point. We had like 16,000 people total and like 12,000 within the park. 180,000 people participated in this streaming as we went from Centennial Park, marched to the Capitol to stand against racism in every form, to show that God was raising up a church in our city that was multi-ethnic, multi-generational, that was standing against racism, standing for the priority of God's heart in worship, in prayer, and in taking our feet to the streets in order to declare our value for those things. And the church on June 19th, on Juneteenth, had the largest gathering of prayer and public demonstration regarding these things of any place in the nation. Okay? Amen. It was beautiful. And God did it. And it was amazing. And part of the reason God did it is because there was a global pandemic that left all the equipment we needed, all the worshipers we needed, the park publicly open, and everything was, everything that you'd say, well, this won't work because, actually worked because. They were like, you can get all the equipment you need at almost, you'll, you'll never be able to do an event as cheap as we did this event because all the equipment was just sitting in warehouses unused because they'd shut down every public event. We were the last public event in Centennial Olympic Park in that entire year. Amazing, right? And as I'm standing there, we had 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 this incredible run of 30 prayer meetings leading up to Stone Mountain. This is some of the history of One Race. race. I'm doing it quickly. Leading up to Stone Mountain. And then at Stone Mountain, they said, we're going to go to the heart of our city and go to the streets of our city. And we ended up actually doing that with two and a half weeks notice. Praise God. And it actually happened. And I'm sitting there. I celebrated with a steak later. But I was just in tears over the goodness of God in this moment as we're worshiping there in the park after having done, we did a march to the Capitol, a march back. It was amazing. Show the march to the Capitol. I mean, show that real quick, Michelle, if you could put that up. Yeah. So 16,000 people, just prayer prayer and proclamation, right, on Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's just amazing. This was a picture, I think I actually took this picture or took one similar to it. And just amazing thing that God did. And so as we're there, you can put the one back up of just Centennial Olympic Park. I'm looking out at this group of people and the Lord speaks to me. Same as he would speak to me one summer later. And he says, build me a church that looks like this. Spoke it right to my heart and I'm just weeping. 
I'm like, Lord, thank you for this day thing. He goes, build me a church that looks like this. And I knew in that moment he was commissioning me to three things. To build a church that was multi-ethnic and multi-generational. That that church was to be abandoned in worship and fervent in prayer. That it was to be in the heart of our city and it was to be a church without walls that was a public witness to the entirety of the city of Atlanta. In our unity and in our commitment to the gospel and to justice. And we did it in a small way on that date, but God said, all the favor, all the miracles, all the things that I put on display to, to our city and to the nation, he goes, I want a permanent reality of that in the city of Atlanta. And I believe Gate City is commissioned. We weren't even Gate City at this time. We didn't even have that name yet. I was like, build me a church. We didn't even necessarily have that full identity. I was like, I guess I'm going to have to go build a church somewhere else because we're Gate City House of Prayer, you know, <laughs> or we're IHOP Atlanta Newbridge. And then we would adopt an identity as a church, and we would go on this journey now three and a half years to where we are today, where we are on the cusp of actualizing some of what God has said, that we would plant a church in the perimeter, that that church, we look at our congregation, the beautiful tapestry, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, a heart for the nations and the unreached. Guys, we're already doing it. You are doing it. And we're getting to take the next step of what God has said in the story that he's been telling. We are abandoned in worship and fervent in prayer. But we're going to raise up five other present-centered prayer-based churches that are going to do it all across our city. And we're going to do 24-7 worship and prayer that we would open the gates of this city to the king of glory. He's going to come in. Let's stand together. So I think it's notable, like those things I'm describing carried him three and a half years. But there was a bizarre prophetic confirmation that day. And I just want to share it with you because I think it's important, right? We, Billy and I get on the mic that day. We're kind of in the closing lap of this event. But we pray our guts out. We're like, Jesus, pray God, king of glory to this city. We're just screaming in prayer for God to do the very thing that was burning in my heart. Because we take the prophetic things that God speaks to us and we, we turn them into conversation with God. Amen. And so we're praying those things. And as we're praying those things God's saying, the worship team, Maverick City Music, I know they're a little band. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Maverick City Music begins to, Naomi Rain, who was one of the singers that day, she begins to sing a chorus. First time she'd ever sung it. Never heard this chorus before, never sang it before, got it spontaneously. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Joy went on to cover that song. We do that song here in our worship. The origination of that song was in response to our prayers on that day, three and a half years ago. I can show you the video, right? Unfortunately, they didn't give me any credit in the album. I didn't get any royalties, nothing. I just prayed. That's, I guess, life of an intercessor, you know? <laughs> just pray the thing in, no credit. It's fine, it's fine. They won a Grammy for that album. Maverick City Music won their first Grammy that's track 13 on the Church Basement album. They won a Grammy. They got that chorus and the guts of that song off our prayer to build the church in the, in the city of Atlanta. Now that's cool, but what is that? That is a prophetic punctuation on the thing God spoke to me where he goes, I'm going to blow this song up. So every time anybody sings it, you just in your heart, I've never shared this publicly, by the way, in your heart, you can just go, that's my song. <laughs> That's what I do. I sit there when we sing and I go, okay, Lord. You, in my moments, it's like I'll be like doubting what God has said and someone will sing that song. I'm like, right, you said it. And you put favor and grace. On, you're going to put favor and grace on it far beyond our natural ability. And you're gonna do phenomenal things just like I've seen you do before. You're the same. And though it seems the resources aren't enough, the people aren't enough, it's not, we don't have enough. That's actually what's gonna qualify us to be useful before the Lord. And we just need to believe what he said together, pray it, have a community like what we're talking about, and marvelous things are going to come out of it. So I know we're a little past time, but I, I wanna just invite anybody who would say, you know what, I wanna say yes to the story you're describing, playing my part in the story. It's just that simple. And, and just give Jesus your yes. And for you, for me in that moment, I just, I, it was so clear, like I'm expecting the direction of God to be, I'm gonna be a missionary in Africa. And he gave me a different direction. 
And we have to be willing to hold our open handed. But so you're not giving a yes to I'm going to join the church plant or you're not giving a yes to this or to that. What you're giving your yes to is this is my spiritual family. This is my home. The story that's being told, I'm going to play my part in it, whatever it might be. And you're hearing it and you're just saying, I bear witness with that story and I believe it's the Lord. And I just want to invite you, you can present yourself to the Lord. Just say yes. Yes to my money, yes to my time, yes to the story. This is my family, I want to say yes. You can just come forward. We're just going to present ourselves to the Lord. And I'm giving the Lord a a fresh yes myself this morning. So yeah, if you want to do that, you can come forward. You don't have to come forward. You can stand right there and put your hands up and we'll know. (laughs) But just do something to just represent your yes before the Lord right now. However God would invite you. You're hearing this, you're going, I'm pricked. I want to build a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church in our city that is a witness, fervent in prayer, abandoned in worship, that does not forget the unreached, that goes, builds an altar, a table, and a road that goes from our neighborhoods to the nations. I thank you, Lord, for this, what you've sown in my heart and how I believe, Lord, that, that what you've sown is said in 10 different ways in our spiritual family. And I thank you for the vision, the grace that is on Gate City to do these things, God. And to do it in a way that's healthy, Lord. That we don't have to be afraid of the vision that you're putting before us. But we go together in doing it. So I think Joy's going to sing Build Your Church. It sounds like she's going to. Let's just worship to this song. If you need to go, if you're a visitor, we have our next room. We're going to go ahead and conclude the service right there and just... Let us linger in the altar. Worship for a few more minutes. If you need to go, feel free to go. If you want to stay, linger in the presence of the Lord, please stay. We're going to worship for a few more minutes. Again, our next room is open and available. If you're a visitor, you want to meet with our leaders. Let's go together in this next season, and let's build God's church in this city. In Jesus' name, amen.